All right, everybody. Welcome to this newest episode of Strange Appalachia. Um, tonight we're coming from the Corona bunker since we're all huddled in here together trying to do this thing. Um, we've got a special guest on tonight's episode, and uh, I'm kind of proud of him. It's my son. And the reason I'm proud of him is I've been doing this paranormal research and legend research for a long time. And he actually has found a Appalachian story, an Appalachian legend that I had never heard of before. Um, so, you know, that's pretty cool. I'm glad he's kind of got that. Uh, I guess he's got the gene to go out and look for paranormal, supernatural stuff. And he's kind of interested in the same things that I am. Of course, he is. He's my son. So um, you got anything to start us off with, J.D., before we get into that story? Um, no, let's let's hear what he's got. Uh after you told me about that, I went out and looked some stuff up on it as well, so uh, so I could talk about it as well. So we'll see see what he's got, and we'll go from there. All right. Without further further ado, here is Arlie Lawson. Hi, welcome to Strange Appalachia. I am Arlie Lawson, and I and I will tell you the story of Soap Sally. So Soap Sally is is supposedly a witch who makes who, who, if there's runaway children in the streets of Appalachia, she'll go and get them, and she'll put them in her sack. And then she she brings them up to her their house and turns it into soap. She turns them into soap, huh? Yeah. So what does she do with the soap? Does it say? It's, then she sells the soap. And before she turned into the ghost witch, she is now, she, she used to be a regular clothes washer. Regular clothes washer, huh? With her soap. And, and whenever their children were, whenever Appalachian children were bad, their, their parents would just give them, give them away to Soap Sally. Wow, that's a pretty scary story, man. So you got anything else you want to say about Soap Sally before we dig into it a little bit? Nothing else? Good. All right. That's all he wants to say. So, Arlie, thanks a lot for that Soap Sally story. That's pretty good. Like I said, that's a story that I'd never heard of. And we did do some uh, some research into this and come to find out it's a true story. It's actually a, a legend from the Appalachian Mountains. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the research I did... You know, he, he hit pretty much all the main points, you know, scary witch, you know, uh, steals children that are, you know, either runaways or um, orphan, you know, people that, that aren't, you know, necessarily, uh, you know, well taken care of, I guess, would be the the opportune way to describe that. But the, uh, she would kidnap these kids, turn them into soap, and then in some cases go back and sell that soap then to whoever is looking for the kids, uh, which is kind of a dark, twisted turn on on the story there. Um, but the research I did also indicated that the witch we talked about way, way, way back when, when we started this thing with the, the dog man that was sort of the mother of the dog man may actually sort of tie into the Soap Sally thing. Yeah, it's funny. Ar Arlie's already left too. He uh, he didn't have time to hang around for the rest of the podcast. I guess he, he had some Minecraft to play or something. Um, but yeah, that's that's the indications that I got as well. I know that some of the stories, the the main bulk of the stories comes from further south of us, right. um, where we're located. But you know, there there are a handful of those stories floating around uh, the Wise County area. Um, the other thing I think is interesting is the name Sally. Soap Sally. Walkin Sally is another name that we get for like a lady in white. Um, that kind we, of we talked about we talked about Walkin Sally a little bit on the uh, traveling ghosts episode that we did. Yeah. So it's interesting that that uh, that that name kind of pops up. Um, it's a pretty common name. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you can hear it in the background, JD, but I've got a huge storm coming in and these cicadas are going crazy. Uh, no, we're not getting any storm or cicada noise here. So, Awesome. I just want to throw that out there real quick to see if we could hear it. Anyway, uh, yeah, that name, Sally, it, it, 
it's a very common name, and so that's probably why it gets attributed to a lot of the different supernatural entities in the area. Sure. Um, all right. Well, anything else on Soap Sally before we move on into the sort of the bigger picture of this episode? No, I just thought it was pretty neat that he found that. And, you Absolutely. know, we'd never, we'd never heard of it before. It's just really interesting. I mean, it just goes to show you that, you know, no matter how long you're doing this, there's always new stuff out there, always new stories out there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, Soap Sally is one of them. Absolutely. Um, so sort of the main course of tonight's episode, I guess you would say, um, we're, we're actually going to push the limits of, of strange Appalachia here just a little bit. Um, we're going to go to the, almost the very Northern tip of the Appalachian mountains up into, um, Vermont, New York, and, uh, even a little bit up into Canada with this next story. So why don't you give us an introduction there? All right. So when you push to the north of us, the the very, very far north, you run into a lake that's Lake Champagne. Is that right? Champagne? Champlain or Champlain. I'm not sure the actual local pronunciation of it, but it's either Champlain or Champlain. And so they have a monster there that they call Champ. And it's kind of like... It's kind of like a Loch Ness monster kind of story. Um, there are tons of sightings of this monster, and it it actually ends up being a little bit different than the Loch Ness monster in a lot of places. Um, some people report it being an eel. Um, of course, there is the classic story of it being a like a, a plesiosaur, and yeah. there's also stories of it just being a, a long necked uh, monster. And so, uh, actually, one of the best photos ever taken of a lake monster is of this this uh, champ. And as far as that picture goes, it's pretty easy to look up. If you just, you know, Google champ or Lake Champagne, you'll get a picture of this monster. And the picture has a hump and then a neck facing away from the shoreline. It's a black and white picture. And uh, let's see, I can get a date real quick. As to when this picture was taken, a lot believe, of people believe, believe that, it was the mid seventies, mid to late seventies, if I'm remembering correctly. Yes, that's what it looks like. Let's see if I can get an exact date. Anyway, supposedly this creature, uh, 1977, it was taken by Sandra Mansi. Yeah. Uh, while she was on vacation, and um, it's a pretty convincing picture. Um. It could definitely be something alive out there. Now, I, I've seen speculation that's a tree stump. And I've actually, there's an artist rendenter, uh, rendering of it as a tree stump and not as a monster. Right. And so uh, uh, I could also see it being a tree stump. So, you know, if her story is to be, be to believe, then it, it actually sank under afterwards. So right. tree stumps typically do that. Mm-hmm. So just just a little bit of background information, not on necessarily the monster, but on the the lake that I think is important when you talk about this. Um, and this is I'm just going to read this straight off the Wikipedia page is the easiest, easiest way I know to do this. Um, so the length of this lake is about one hundred and seven miles long, roughly 14 miles wide. Um but the the important thing that I, I want to bring up here, the average depth of the lake is 64 feet. The max depth, however, is 400 feet. And so in my mind, as I'm reading that, you know, the average depth, depth is 64. The max depth is 400. So that tells me that somewhere along the way, there is some that the lake is going to be way more shallow uh, to sort of bring that average closer to the 64 that it is instead of the 400 that it is at its deepest point. Does that make sense? Yes. So a lot of this lake, just, just going by that, does not seem to me like it's going to be deep enough um, to have a large monster living in it full time. Now, the other thing is, you know, if this is an eel-like monster, then that sort of goes out the window. That doesn't really apply much. 
So yeah, I, you know there was a there's a a lady that's taken. She has a sonogram of this lake, and there's two large ill-like creatures in this sonogram that she's taken. Or mm-hmm. I don't guess it's a sonogram. I guess it's just a sonar reading. She's using that side scan sonar. Yeah. Uh, and I was researching her and her little group that goes out and does the research. And so the sonar that she was using, they actually interviewed the guy that, that owns the company that makes that sonar. And he said that the speed that the boat was going in at the time, it could have caused some distortion, but that he had honestly never seen anything like it before. So once again, it, it's one of those answers that doesn't say yes or no. There's a lot of that. Um, evolving not just this creature but any type of paranormal thing right the other thing that I had uh, noticed as I was researching the lake itself is apparently there are parts of the lake um, or used to be parts of the lake that were had a lot of DDT in them from uh, the 40s and the 50s uh, with heavy commercial farming stuff like that um maybe not commercial farming but definitely a lot of farms and stuff in the area would would do that and that uh a lot of the the species that lived in or near the lake uh did not thrive so well so again that's sort of a a point against there being something large living in the lake uh from previously at at least that it, it would be hard for them to have survived through that if a lot of the smaller fish that that they were surviving on uh, had died out as well. Um, I'm going to read a quote here real quick from Samuel de Champagne, and he's the guy that actually surveyed the lake in 1609. And he has a quote that a lot of people actually attribute to him seeing Champ, but he says, uh, there is also a great abundance of fish of many varieties among others. One called by the savages of the country, let me pronounce this right, Chalafuror, which varies in length, the largest, as the people told me, eight to ten feet long. I saw some five feet long, which were as large around as my thigh, the head being as big as two of my fists, with a snout two and a half feet long, and a double row of teeth that are very sharp and dangerous. Its body and its shape is very much like that of a pike, but is well armored with scales so strong that a pin yard cannot pierce it, and it's the color of silver gray. And so that is very often attributed to being champ. Um, probably what he's describing there is a gar, yeah. some kind of large gar. But, you know, a lot of people see that quote and then think, you know, there's got to be something monstrous out here. And, and a gar is pretty monstrous. Yeah, if you've never seen one, that's a pretty terrifying fish. Can be absolutely, especially if you don't know what one is and you see it and you're like, "Wow, that thing is, uh, you know, a deadly looking something." You know, and and like I said, it's it's a weird looking fish. Um, I tell you, the the coolest piece of evidence I saw and that I've heard so far is there is actually a uh, a marine biologist that was doing recordings on the lake and. Uh, she's actually in college when she did it, but it, she came up with uh, echolocation in the lake. I don't know if you saw that or not, but she has there's recorded echolocation. Yeah, she's recorded echolocation in the lake. And as far as we know, there should be no species in the lake that does any type of echolocation. That is interesting. I, I didn't find that in any of my... Um, I'm, I'm finding it right now. It was from 2003, it looks like. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and when you play it, it sounds like echolocation. Yeah. That's and very cool. Of, it released her, the cryptozoologist. Her name is Katie Elizabeth. And Dennis Hall was with her when this happened. That's another guy that was with her. And they, it sounds like echolocation. Uh, like I said, they, they list her as a cryptozoologist. But... You know, I've seen her listed as a, a marine biologist. The the information I'm looking at here just says it's a, a research institute. So it doesn't give specific names. So that's definitely interesting. I'll, I'll have to check that out. Um, 
but it, it's it's an interesting thing, and just like with all of these cryptids and and stories that that we've talked about, especially the bigger ones, the the Bigfoot type story stuff like that, the local area has really embraced the story, um, and you know they're they're you know ha- definitely have a tourism industry based on it. Uh, they have some festivals in, in that area that are, you know, based on Champ or um, I've seen him called Champy as well. Uh, so Champ or Champy uh, festivals and stuff like that in the area. So, you know, a lot of really cool stuff going on there with that. So, uh, you know, I was you know, just sort of blown away by how much evidence there really was of this thing once you started looking into it. Because, I mean, like, you know, everybody's heard of the Loch Ness Monster, but that one is, you know, almost certainly, you know, when you start looking into it, a hoax or, you know, a story at, at the very least, maybe not necessarily a hoax, but definitely a story that somebody was trying to run with. But this one has some some actual interesting evidence that goes with it that, you know, is not so easily disproven and, and written off. I know that a lot of times um, those large lakes up north, they have a, the Native Americans have a story of a thing called Mishimsaway, and that that is the water panther, and it's supposed to be a uh, basically a, a giant panther with a long neck that lives underwater. And so, you know, I could see I could see them getting if there is a creature, um, I could see them getting that confused. I mean. You know, it's it's a uh, if you've never seen anything like that before, and you've got you know one group of a weird creature living there, you're going to try to, especially if you're a native indigenous culture, you're going to try to attribute it to what you know. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, you see that. Um, so yeah, it's pretty interesting. Uh, it's a pretty interesting story. I'm glad that we found it and got to talk about it a little bit, especially the part with echolocation. That's what blew me away. Yeah, I, I, like I said, until just now, I hadn't read that, so I'll have to go look into that and listen to it and, you know, research that just a little bit. Yeah, give it a look. It's pretty interesting. All right, well, anything else to add on the champy note? Uh, that's all I got on the champy note. Um, nothing really to report. Yeah. Or nothing uh, else to report. Yeah. The other thing, if you want to talk about a little bit, we've got a little bit of time left here uh, from our time limit we were shooting for there. Um, You want to talk about some of the stuff we we want to do coming up next couple of weeks here? Um, Yeah, we can. Um, So, you know, this summer, we've not had a lot of uh, of time this summer. J.D., of course, works all summer at the camp, and I've been down here. And with the coronavirus going on and everything, we've not had that much time to go out and research if we wanted to. But coming up here this this next few weeks, we're hoping that to get at least one expedition in up to where where we usually go. Um, we've got a couple of new toys to play around with. I, I managed to finally get a hold of a drone, and JD managed to get a hold of a FLIR unit. Um, and so we're really itching to test those two those two things out out in the field to see what we can come up with. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we, I've also got a couple of wireless cameras, and I don't know how well they're going to work in the woods because you got to plug them up. So unless trees are growing power, then uh, I don't guess we'll be using them that much. But you know, that, it's pretty neat that we're going to have those for uh, for any of our indoor investigations. Yeah, and we we like like Charlie said there, we've we've got at least one uh, expedition or, or outing coming up that we're looking at doing. And we're hoping to get in two or three more, uh, to various locations that are, uh, outdoors where we can, uh, we don't have to worry about the coronavirus outbreak and, and all that good stuff. So, uh, you know, we're, we're doing our best to get stuff out. It, like he said, it's been a little, little hectic getting schedules to work out. Uh, and you would think with the coronavirus and everybody being inside, we would have more time to do this, but it's actually ended up being the exact opposite of that. We've had less time. So, um, you know, bear with us. We're, we're going to keep doing this, try to get out as many as we, uh, many of these podcast episodes as we can the next little bit and hopefully get a couple or three, maybe 
on site, on location expedition films out and see how those go. Yeah, I know. Hopefully, we can go. We've got an area near the lake, um, kind of close to where John Ford had his sighting, and uh, hopefully, we can get down there. And, and I mean, that's been years ago, but you never know what you're going to find. It'll right. be worth going. For. I mean, if nothing else, it'll be nice to go camping. Yeah, and I, I've had a couple of more uh, people tell me some interesting stuff from that area. So we uh, may have more than just one thing to look into now. So that's, oh, that's entertaining. That's awesome. All right, J.D., you want to close us out? Uh, sure. Uh, just like I always say here, guys, if you like what you hear, give us a like. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Um, check us out over on Facebook at Strange Appalachia. Um, hopefully here soon we'll be able to get out to some of these uh, events and, and uh, things like that as they start happening again, as the, the coronavirus hopefully runs its course here soon. Uh, we'll get out and hopefully we'll have some, some, uh, you know, stuff for you to look at and, and, uh, share with your friends and stuff like that. But like I said, right now, subscribe, like all that good stuff. And, uh, you know, if you've got a story or anything you'd like to share with us, anything you'd like to hear us talk about, uh, stuff like that, let us know. We're, we're always open to ideas. So, uh. See y'all next week, uh, hopefully, maybe before then, um, and y'all be awesome. <laughs> All right, y'all take it easy. Thanks.